Lord Bathurst then informed him that commissioners appointed by Russia, Austria, and France were coming to reside in St. Helena. But these commissioners will have no power to interfere in the measures which the government considers expedient. They will simply be correspondents to their respective courts. These provisional instructions would be completed as soon as an act of parliament could clothe this injustice in a lavishly legal form. Nevertheless, even before this act had been proposed, Lord Bathurst, in a dispatch dated January 10th, informed Sir Hudson Lowe that by orders of the Prince Regent, he should immediately upon his arrival inform all the persons comprising the suite of Napoleon Bonaparte, including also his servants, that they were free to leave the island immediately and to return to Europe or to cross to the United States of America. But any of them wishing to remain in St. Helena were to declare in writing that they state of their own free will and that they were prepared to submit to any restriction it might be considered necessary to impose upon Napoleon Bonaparte. This fact had been communicated verbally to the emperor's companions aboard the Northumberland when it appeared just convention, but now no one could mistake its reality in obliging them to agree to this undertaking. It was the intention that they should contract a personal engagement, and just as in this formula the emperor was stripped of all his titles and position, so in the same way his companions would recognize the legality, even the justifiableness of the captivity. Certainly they were free not to sign, but they would in that case more than likely be deported to the Cape. Hudson Lowe communicated the exact formula in English on April 18th. The emperor had it translated and refused to approve it, dictating one himself, which the servants were to sign. Les Kaisers, Gorgo, Montsalain, and Bertrand, faced with what was demanded of them, hesitated and experienced a perplexity which the emperor was anxious not to create. He intended to leave to each the initiative and responsibility for his acquiescence, but if his companions would not sign this undertaking and were therefore expelled from St. Helena, was he going to be left alone from April 18th to 20th? From Longwood to Plantation House, there were comings and goings of the governor, the aides de camp, and the grand marshal. Finally, on the 20th, Las Casas, Montalan, and Gorgo brought an undertaking, not like the product of the English ministry and proposed by the governor, but one inspired by their own bombast and personal pride. The grand marshal, under the necessity of signing or embarking within a week with his family on board, the Phaeton bound for the cave, drew up a compilation which answered all purposes. The emperor's health does not permit my leaving him at the moment, and no other means being open to me for fulfilling the undertaking I have made. I declare that it is my desire to remain in St. Helena and to be liable to the same regulations as the emperor. Lowe could have turned down these declarations, none of which conformed to the copy presented and could have deported all the emperor's companions to the Cape. But he did not, for at that moment, he did not believe himself authorized to do so. That is why he made the proposition in the first place. He knew that he would be respecting the wishes of his government by reducing expenditure and by cutting down Napoleon's servants to a minimum, but he was obliged to declare that no one would desert him, which was just what the ministry had supposed would be the case. He then formally proposed from this moment onwards to put them all at a distance with the possible exception of Las Casas. The attitude he wrote, which they adopt upon every occasion, either verbally or in writing, their opinion upon the measures which the government has thought fit to impose regarding Napoleon himself should furnish sufficient reason for their removal to distant residences. All this was to be found in the spirit of his written instructions, but he had before his departure received verbal instructions regarding the economies to be affected in the Longwood establishment for immediately after landing. He had examined the fortnightly accounts kept by the purveyor Balcom, from which after two of these accounts he estimated the annual expense at between 325 and 400,000 francs. This expense, he said, was due to the presence of 51 people, of whom only nine with four children comprised the general suite, the others with the exception of two officers of the guard being domestic servants. His figure of 51 was actually an underestimate and is easily explainable when the area of Longwood is taken into account. And as to expense, that was appreciably increased over and above the normally high prices on the island by the 
difficulties of transport and the greed of the purveyor. But it was not this that the ministry had in mind or were desirous of cutting down. The frigate Newcastle brought dispatches dated April 15th in which Lord Bathurst did Tales, what had been the views of the government, and exactly from the Emperor's companions, the declaration imposed upon them. I hope, he wrote, that you will have succeeded in considerably reducing the number of people in the Bonaparte household by encouraging the inclination several of them have had of returning home, or at least to leaving St. Helena. Without doubt, it was decided to suppress all possible plots with the inhabitants or even with the commissioners of the powers who would have too little to do, not to be inclined to do harm, but the essential stipulation was to reduce the expenses of the upkeep and household of Bonaparte, so that the two together should not exceed 8,000 pounds a year, including wine and whatever extraordinary expenditure there might be. And the minister of his Britannic Majesty added in the name of his government in case Bonaparte complains of the curtailment which this modification will cause. It will be lawful to allow him all the abundance he desires regarding food and so on, provided he supplies the necessary funds to cover expenses above 8,000 pounds. According to what I hear, he is not short of money and he must pay the salary the reason wages of the members of his suite and servants who continue to remain with him, but I hope you will persuade most of them to accept the offer you have made to them. Therefore, when Hudson Lowe dealt with the emperor's servants and demanded that each one should, in his presence, repeat the declaration that he intended to remain in St. Helena, a declaration they had already made in the presence of Sir Thomas Reed, he was acting upon specific orders for his ministry. Upon a verbal order, he renewed in writing, and when he adopted this miserable quibbling against Napoleon's expenses, he was strictly carrying out the instructions he had received. But even he did not dare to go to extremes. Admiral Cockburn had estimated the annual expenses of the household at 18,000 pounds. Since then, actual facts seem to have shown that they could not possibly be less than 19,000 pounds and would very likely reach 20,000 pounds. The regular expenses amounted to 500, 5,500 pounds. Pounds for the upkeep of buildings, the purveyors' wages, the cost of transportation from Jamestown to Longwood, and the keep of the officers of the guard in the stable. There, therefore, remained 13,500 pounds, which divided among the 39 individuals comprising the Longwood household. There had been as many as 55 amounted to each for a day, 14, which at St. Helena, seen at St. Helena prices were four times those in London were worth three sixths and had to suffice for all the expenses of lighting, fuel, and food in fixing the sum of 8,000 pounds, of which he agreed to allot 5,500 for regular expenses. There remained 2,500 pounds for household necessaries or 10 pounds, 10 pence per person per day. This is what is allowed a soldier, said the emperor in concluding the argument, which Lowe did not even attempt to refute. What end had the English government in view in thus reducing the sum allocated to the emperor's maintenance to compel him to send back most of his companions in order to isolate him and to render him more easily handled? Note the patterns. This object was formerly admitted in Lord Bathurst's dispatches to affect an economy and what had not been considered politic to bind the powers to pay their share of the expense by reducing it to a bare minimum and finally to compel the emperor to supply his own material needs and make him disclose where his treasure was hidden to obtain any money he had right for it and his letters like those of his companions would be transmitted open to the governor who would send them still open to the minister what was easier after that than to come upon the holders of the funds and to seize the huge sums which the emperor had been obliged to put in safekeeping. Actually, among his enemies who judged him according to their own standards, such was a unanimously acknowledged opinion that he who for 30 years had been master of Europe, who had handled all the taxes imposed by his victories upon sovereigns and peoples, must be prodigiously rich, and that this wealth should legally revert to the conquerors as the material fruit of their triumph. If it happened 
that instead of the anticipated treasure server of thousands of francs only were found, they should not be taken, but instead should be set apart in such a manner that they could be used for Napoleon's needs until his death. In this manner, he had already been relieved of 4,000 Napoleons during the change over from the Belrefin to the Northumberland. At this time, the emperor had succeeded in keeping 250,000 francs from the English by distributing them in eight belts among his companions and returning them to Marchand, who was appointed treasurer immediately upon the arrival at St. Helena. This sum accrued for the most part from the allowance made to the emperor on June 28th by his treasurer of the sum of 183, 333 francs that resulted the sale of some 5% stock which Napoleon owned. He called this sum his reserve and was determined to touch it only in case of absolute necessity. As a result of several economies, he added to it so much that in 1821 it totaled 300,000 francs. 